Thanks for listening to A Long Time in Finance with Jonathan Ford and Neil Collins in partnership with Briefcase News, the service that brings intelligent curation and analysis to your media monitor. A little over a week ago, hardly anyone had heard of the Silicon Valley Bank. Then this Californian lender, which is banked to many of the world's startups, suddenly announced that it needed to raise billions of dollars very fast. The reason? its relatively small number of tech corporate customers wanted their cash back. And the only way to cash them out was to sell SVB's mountain of bonds, which had already dropped in value because of Fed interest rate rises. A week on, an SVB has been taken over by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in America, and a British branch has been scooped up by the HSBC and rescued. So we thought we'd get our old, an old friend of the show, Isabella Kaminska, founder of The Blind Spot, on to discuss what all this means. Hi, Izzy. Welcome back. Hello. Nice to be here. I think we should start. I don't know what you make of it, Neil, but I think we should start by kind of asking Izzy to explain a little bit about SVB. What sort of bank was it? And why on earth did it get into such enormous trouble? <laughs> SVB is, it's been going since about 1983, and it was a specialist bank focused on the tech startup scene in California. And it grew to a relatively sizable sum. I mean, it was never in the systemic category, but it was, it had about 200 billion worth of assets. And its unique sort of position in the market was servicing all these startups and doing it in a very roundabout way. So the VCs would fund the startups. That's venture capitalists, just to establish our, our initials. And Silicon Valley Bank would, in some cases, also try and compete by offering them loans. And if you took these loans, or actually they also invested in, on, on an equity basis in startups as well. Either way, if you took the loans and or their equity cash, they would basically ask you to bank with them. So it, it created a kind of captured market where these um, new startup founders would do almost all their banking services with the bank, including everything from payroll to wealth management to credit cards and and beyond. Okay. And that created a sort of concentration risk. So a startup raises, say, $10 million from, from venture capitalists in California that's very expensive because they're giving away their equity and the bank pops up and says, oh, you don't, I'll give you a third of that, say 3 million or so as a loan, as opposed to almost zero interest rates. And for the company, it's a no brainer because it eliminates all those shares they have to sell diluting their own interest and they don't have to pay much of an interest charge on the loan. But the catch, as you say, is they have to give all the money to SVB. They have to deposit it all with SVB. That's right. Although SVB also had a venture arm itself. So it, it was doing direct investments sure. in a lot of startups as well. But by and large, that's exactly how it worked. So that, that gave them this enormous sort of position in banking to a lot of startups. I mean, obviously, we've had a bit of a, a decline in the value of startups recently. And also, obviously, a rise in interest rates some would say the two might be connected. To what extent does that did that create the backdrop for this crunch? What gave it its special crunchy feature? So everything sort of started to go a bit wrong for them with the pandemic. They got a huge amount of deposits during that period, mostly because there was quite a lot of startup activity and also because people got essentially a lot of crypto money. They were banking a lot of crypto firms as well. Mm. And so deposits went through the roof during COVID and there was less spending. The result was that it was a very hard time to reinvest that money. So they ended up going up the curve, as they say. So rather than... Up the curve? Up, <laughs> so banks traditionally borrow short, that is, they take deposits, which which they are on the hook to give back at any moment, and they lend long. That's about the definition of a bank, I would say. That okay. is the definition of, of a bank. But in this case, they didn't have so many opportunities to, to lend long in the sense of giving loans and creating assets, a loan book from loans to these new firms. They were putting their money in treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, mainly because it was the best and easiest way to make a little bit of yield during a time when yields were relatively low. And this is where they got into trouble because people call it a matched book. It was far from a matched book. And as rates started to rise, 
this created a very loss making position on their on their balance sheet the bonds got, went down in value whilst their liabilities continued to be the same and this this means you know from an accounting perspective they were very much encouraged to change the attribution of these um bonds from being available for sale to held to maturity and that was the key thing that kind of got them in trouble because if you do that then theoretically you never have to sell the bonds so you don't have to materialize the loss that comes about from the fact that these bonds in the market have gone down in price and by the way the bonds are going down in price mainly because the fed is raising rates the asset quality is is the same in many ways it's just a function of the interest rate environment i think that for a start svb was a very unusual bank insofar as it was very short of customers to lend to because the vast majority of its assets came in as essentially as deposits and they There's didn't really know what to do with them. And that is why they started buying US Treasury bonds almost at any price. And I think this is where they started to go seriously wrong. They're not the only ones, by the way, and we may find there are an awful lot more who thought that if you bought a 20-year bond on a 1% yield, that would all be fine. But Neil, but if they had lent their money to a bunch of startups, they would have become even more concentrated. Surely buying treasury bonds made them safer. No, I don't think that's right, because the amount they forwarded to the customers were pretty small, because they weren't, in that sense, a lending bank. They were, they were a lender. Well, yeah, but if you look at their balance sheet, most of it was in longer dated treasury bonds. This was essentially a function of the pandemic, because they didn't have the opportunity to lend during that time. And a lot of the accounts ballooned, mainly because of everything from the fact that crypto was going up in value in a lot of those companies. Like, for example, they were a banker to the USDC, which was a very big stablecoin. You know, in theory, these assets were safe for as long as the, the books were matched. If they could have held them to maturity they would have performed as expected. But the problem was that they were not liquid. And as the as the deposits came out, they had no cho choice but to liquidate these bonds earlier than expected. And this is how they got into trouble last week. Okay, so, so let's just try and summarize. We basically have a backdrop where essentially the tech market is souring. Silicon Valley Bank has taken in huge amounts of money from a relatively small number of corporate customers. It has no real retail deposit base. And those corporate customers who are presumably reasonably smart, even though they all put their money into Silicon Valley Bank, are starting to draw it down. That dynamic of a bank which has very few retail deposits and lots of corporate customers who have uninsured deposits, therefore, I think it's $250,000 is the limit on insurance for each US bank account. Those customers start to get twitchy about what on earth is going on because they can see that the bank has huge pile of, of bonds which are essentially the assets of the bank or by and large the assets of the bank. And if they were all to run at the same time, someone would be at the back of the queue. So is that a fair characterization of sort of where we got to last week? The real pressure point was when they were forced to sell their bond portfolio to some degree. Mm. They materialized a 1.8 billion loss as a yep. result, right? And that's when they had to go to the market with a formal capital raising offer, but they failed to mm. attract any bidders. And as a result, you know, people started to panic. It was all exacerbated by the fact that all these tech VCs are very prominent on Twitter. Mm. Before you knew it, there was a sort of social media doom loop that was emerging after Peter Thiel, I think, announced that he was recommending that all his portfolio companies to move their money. And before you knew it, every other sort of tech voice on Twitter was recommending the same. So you saw a speed of light virtual bank run. And I think that's what's really interesting is that, you know, half of Silicon Valley is pushing the idea of, of how frictionless payments are the future of finance. But what I say is they wanted frictionless payments, but they got <laughs> and frictionless they got them. bank runs, right? <laughs> the thing I find most extraordinary is that nobody in this bank clearly ever thought that 
interest rates would go up and thus the value of their investments would go down as the two things are the converse of the other. Nobody had said, well, what happens if interest rates during the 20-year life of these bonds goes up from 1% to, say, 4%, in which case the value of the bonds would fall dramatically. And they clearly didn't have the capital to cover that. And nobody, it seems to me, ever asked that question. I mean, no cure for stupidity, I'm afraid, I would say, because there's no way on earth that long-term rates were going to stay at the level of 2019 indefinitely. But that's the same situation for every bank, is it not? Of course it is. But so most are you banks, saying that all banks but, should have been told that they're to stop, to stop banking or to no, what they have done as a No, no. Uh, the you banks, can hedge against it. it so in some and cases, also, you know, you would you, have you, a total return swap or some sort of yeah, okay. hedge. Exactly. And you don't, you don't just buy long bonds, which is what they did in an attempt to try and generate some revenue because the returns on the shortest bonds were almost zero. You know, if you could continue to originate new business at the higher rates, then it would all kind of equal out. But they couldn't because the tech sector was, you know, in a downturn. If they had a, had a more diversified loan book and loan business, then they may have got away with it. But they didn't because the concentration was very clear in one sector. OK, but Neil's point is basically, and I agree with him, that there's a massive regulatory failure here. The, the, the supervisors of the bank should have seen that this was a very risky institution. It had this huge unhedged bond portfolio. It had a bunch of corporate investors with massive 90% of the deposits were uninsured. This is pretty basic banking regulation, isn't it? I think part of the problem was that it was just under the threshold for being considered a strategically Systemic. important bank. Yes. $250 billion of deposits, and it was about 240 I seem to remember reading somewhere that they were actually lobbying for that threshold to be raised, which again would be a red flag to the regulators, I would have thought. This is incredibly stupid, but at the same time, um, <laughs> your point about them not seeing interest rates going up, I mean, when you see the dialogue on Twitter, I mean, they are very clearly blaming the Fed and saying things like, well, the Fed promised to keep rates low forever and then they reneged on that. So it's the Fed's fault, you know. Yeah, but that's, and a lot of them are libertarian minded and I find it quite amusing. The yeah, well, that's a natural human out. response, of course, to blame someone else. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you'd have thought that somewhere in the organisation, they did have quite a large number of people. Somebody would have said, well, what if? Let's think on a little bit more about, we talked about the causes, well, let's think about the consequences. And who are the losers from all this in terms of, we can think about the, the wider implications, uh, but also there's the, the narrow effect. In my view, the biggest losers from this are all the venture capitalists who rather foolishly allowed tech companies to put all their money in this one wobbly institution. And they're supposed to be incredibly smart investors, and yet they don't seem to have done the most basic due diligence. Yes. And also, I mean, if George Osborne is to be believed, the entire tech sector in the UK was under threat. Sentence of death. Point. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Which also begs the question, like, why is our entire startup sector so exposed to just one particular institution? How did that come about? You know, imagine if HSBC, which ended up buying the UK division hadn't appeared. I think there were plan Bs, which involved a lot more active government involvement, whether through the British Business Bank or other. The whole point of post-crisis regulation was that taxpayers would never be on Don't the hook again. again for these sorts oh. of things, you know, and governments were not to bail out any of these sorts of institutions. And yet here we are. And there is a really substantial case of moral hazard again, because even though theoretically, I mean, the, the Fed came out and said, oh, you know, we, we've managed to create a rescue package that doesn't involve taxpayers. But they have inadvertently provided a guarantee to all US deposits, even the supposedly uninsured so, ones. So what you're saying is, despite the fact that since the crisis, we have pretty much, you know, quadrupled or quintupled the size of all the rule books and the Dodd-Frank Act and all this. <laughs> We're back at the starting line with the, yeah. basically the first explosion that takes place below decks at a financial institution, not even a very large one. And the taxpayer is wheezing back up to supply its help. And the reason they've done it is because they really were concerned about potential contagion on a very 
large level. So you saw the collapse in bank stock prices. And one of the institutions that nobody really saw as a threat is, is Schwab, which is an asset manager. Schwab has a similar mismatch in terms of unrealized losses on, on portfolio bonds because they are banking a lot of high net worths etc that's rich people <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry i'm gonna have to catch a bit, uh, haul yes. you up on all these so terms of art and and acronyms you're using is so that's people. what they are <laughs> rich people let's just call yeah. them what they really are but the fear was that you know people might suddenly realize oops you know this uninsured element of my wealth is at risk and mm, if yeah. they did they would start pulling their money from all sorts of institutions including yeah. Schwab they would have also suffered a similar un, you know liquidity issue and all the money will have ended up with JP Morgan exactly <laughs> which then becomes even bigger <laughs> becomes even bigger and more dominant I'm fascinated by the what's happened at this end with the rescue of the UK bank by HSBC, which has spared the taxpayers embarrassment, blushes, and indeed money. Of course, HSBC is a bank with a lot of interests in Hong Kong and China. And it's been pilloried, not very officially, but by widespread attacks because it's kowtowing to the Chinese. And I suspect that in part of the discussions over a hectic weekend was, please lay off us and we are doing our best because we've got to ride these two horses of West and East. In return, we will rescue this bank for you at zero cost. I, I would make a more specific prediction, which is I wouldn't be surprised if the famous George Osborne, that's him again, pops up. His balance sheet tax, which has long been the bane of HSBC's life because it's all levied on their worldwide balance sheet, is reformed in some way to reduce the cost to them as a result of their public spirited rescue of this uh, institution. But that may, that's just a guess. I think it's a pretty fair guess, though, because the will, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts yeah. because it's yeah. quite interesting to see that what looked like a bargain on the face of it buying all these assets for a pound, yeah. you notice that the shares have fallen along with all the other bank shares yeah, in the UK. I think you're absolutely right, Neil. And I think the question for me was, you know, why was HSBC up for it? When you looked at the other types of institutions that were supposedly in the auctions, they were all very, you know, unfamiliar names like Bank of London and HSBC is not really known as a tech-friendly bank. And I think a lot of the startups are going to be very upset about being banked by HSBC, which is far more bureaucratic and um, harder to deal with generally. The HSBC is saying, oh, well, this is why we've gone for it, because you know we don't have a very strong tech presence. So there's a complementary kind of dynamic. However, we don't know anything about the balance sheet of Silicon Valley UK Bank. There's very little that has been exposed. We know it had some, I think they said it was like 1.4 billion tangible equity equity, but we don't know the quality of the assets. And, and there isn't a lot of information on the group financials, but it doesn't look to me like the UK division is going to be super profitable. <laughs> if you only pay a pound for it, it doesn't have to be particularly profitable. Indeed, if it washes its face, it will be a triumph. That is right. Exactly. Yeah, that's the bank banking side of it. But what about the tech side of it? What does this say about... Uh, the tech industry and what's happening there. And is it a harbinger of more explosions to come? We've obviously seen a couple of the crypto quasi- <laughs> a harbing, I hesitate. A harbinger to, I hesitate. of explosions. That's it's a good harbinger. one. Is it a harbinger? <laughs> Harbinger of Isn't that the sort of thing they used to use on the Telegraph all the time? <laughs> I'd strike, In a harbinger of future explosions. I would strike a line straight ah, through he's it. very tough. Sorry, <laughs> over to you, Gizzy. Harbingers of other explosions. Oh, speaking of harbingers <laughs> of future explosions, I, I think it's fairly hilarious that this is happening under the you know, auspices of a prime minister who's not only a former banker, but is married literally to the tech industry. So in some ways... That is great. And apparently the mood in Westminster was very jubilant. They saw it as an excellent deal that avoided taxpayer 
exposure and were very proud of themselves. Yeah, quite right too, I would say. Yeah. On one side, it's a great demonstration of Rishi's skills. He was actually at the time on a plane on his way to San Diego, apparently. But the other side is really, you know, what is happening to the UK tech sector more broadly. And I've been hearing from London-based VCs operating specifically in the fintech sector that there's a massive deterioration going on in, in the sector these valuations are going to be put under pressure in the next few months anyway. Everyone is exposed to cash burn at the moment. And I don't think it's a very rosy outlook. So had Silicon Valley Bank gone down, it would have been an early demise of the sector. But I, I think maybe it's just kicked the can down the road. The tech sector here is still exposed. And I'm not really confident that we are investing in the right sort of tech because so much of the tech here is fintech and crypto tech like Rishi wants to be the center of effectively zero-sum activity in my opinion a lot of it whether that's going to really you know bring the UK out of its economic malaise I'm not so sure but how is Nibblecoin doing? (laughs) <laughs> I haven't Nibble dared coin. look. <laughs> but it, I think it's impossible to get very many more noughts on a computer screen than are already there whenever you look at it. <laughs> um, but I, I, I take the point of what you've been saying, but do you think that this event is going to, to do serious damage given the fact that the financial side of it in the UK has been rescued? No, I think the underlying like fundamentals of the tech startup scene in the UK are already under pressure. And why? Why do you think they are? What's the what's driving it? Too much financial stuff. Yeah, and higher interest rates. And yeah, so much interest exposure. rates at the dizzy heights of four percent. What sort of world are these people in? This is, you know, all these, a lot of these fintechs and startups were designed on what are called capital light, you know, models, which should theoretically do well in high interest rate environments, but they're mostly focused on being the next unicorn. And whilst VC cash is, you know, cheap and plentiful, you can afford to maintain a lot of them who are de de facto competing against each other to be the big cheese in their little area. But once interest rates start to go up, consolidation becomes an obvious thing and there can be only one. And this is what we're seeing at the moment is that the weaker players are being shaken out of the market quite aggressively. And I don't think, you know, saving Silicon Valley Bank is going to do much to change that dynamic. I suppose they're far too busy to read the financial pages, pointing out that interest rates have been too low for too long. I know. Terrible. A stopped stopped clock is finally right. (laughs) (laughs) Twice a day. Uh, I do take exception to that rather cheap shot, actually. (laughs) But I expect I can find one of my own to fire back quite soon. Okay. I just I think the bigger question really is what did sort of very prolonged period of zero rates do to the economy in terms of misallocation of capital? You know, how many of these businesses are real productive value adding enterprises, and how much of them are just Ponzi's? (laughs) To to use what? What? No, I think I think you're right. Some of them. Some of them would be sort of dead on arrival. Yeah. Because the era of pre-revenue, you know, uh, enterprises that can live for years without making yeah. any profits or yeah. Yeah. revenues are over. Like, so every yeah. everyone is now centered on profitability yeah. and we don't have that big sort of, you know, five-year runway where we can work in loss-making mode until we hope to become a unicorn. Yeah. A student of history would have pointed this out to them. Well, this is why a long time in finance is important. You Absolutely. Can shoot, yeah. You know, the, we should have had this podcast three years ago. <laughs> the idea, well, Damn, actually, I we think... We didn't exist then. I think I probably started saying interest rates are far too low about three years ago. And the, the Bank of England has been complicit in this conspiracy to keep interest rates below any reasonable level, which would have allowed this process to take place in a more leisurely and controlled manner to get to where we are today. But if you think about it, the whole point of zero interest rates was to inspire risk taking at a time when nobody wanted to take risk. And and the fact that all these you know, young guns went out there and did crazy things with crypto and God knows what. In some ways, we created the conditions to allow for that because we needed to prop up the economy. And it was it made sense to like effectively hand over lots of money to 
the crypto industry. <laughs> yeah. But that, that was an obvious consequence of, of, so, of that sort so of So how bearish are you that this is just the start of a season of truth-telling about the real value of the assets on the one side and the liabilities on the other side of the bank balance sheet and indeed the quasi-bank balance sheets? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, you know, if the central banks hold their nerve and don't cut rates, then I think we will see increasingly who doesn't have any clothes on in the market because we we did go for a sort of emperor's new clothes phenomenon. And as they say, when, what is the expression? <laughs> when the tide goes out, oh, you no. find out who wasn't oh, wearing any no. shorts. No, let's not have that one, please. Little it's, C with a circle around it, Warren su- Buffett. It's such a cliche. Everywhere, everyone's said this, but it, it, you know, it doesn't add anything, really. But it's true. <laughs> that was A Long Time in Finance with Jonathan Ford and Neil Collins. Production and editing by Nick Hilton. And our sponsorship partner is Briefcase.News. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review it on your podcast app, as that will help new listeners find us.